Hello, I'm Cody Rose. I'm here with Max Kona and Jeff Geisinger, and we're going to present our project entitled Revitalizing Lower Roxbury, a Housing and Neighborhood Walkability Study. Lower Roxbury is a neighborhood within Boston, highlighted here. Uh, the American City Coalition has identified these particular highlighted opportunity sites within a greater Lower Roxbury revitalization area, and we'd like to thank the American City Coalition for their support and background provision during this project. In particular, we're concerned with the public housing within Lower Roxbury. And that has led us to our research question. How can planners and architects transform public housing in a way that is environmentally responsible, socially equitable, and sensitive to the existing community and urban fabric? And to answer this question more concretely, I'm going to turn things over to Jeff. Public housing can be defined as publicly subsidized housing for low-income families, the disabled and the elderly. In the United States, public housing is, is administered at the national level by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and owned locally by municipal entities such as the Boston Housing Authority. Public housing in the U.S. is typically characterized by an aging building stock, and a recent national study has pointed to the potential for significant energy and financial savings should these buildings be upgraded, savings that housing authorities could reinvest in their provision of affordable housing. In order to provide context for our study, let's first look at some examples of how public housing has been transformed in Boston. In the 1980s, before redevelopment became a national trend, the Boston Housing Authority worked with local communities to improve living conditions for three of its post-war public housing projects. The Commonwealth Development was a successful example from this period, in which housing, the Housing Authority rehabilitated existing buildings and upgraded common spaces with minimal demolition. Since the 90s, national housing policies like Hope 6 and Choice Neighborhoods have aimed to change distressed public housing sites into mixed-use, mixed-income communities. Under these policies, existing housing is usually demolished and replaced with new market-driven housing and a minimum allotment of affordable units. Relocating families displaced from demolition is often an unavoidable consequence that local housing authorities have to deal with as part of these initiatives. Our project asks if a middle ground can be found between rehabilitation and new construction so that private investment can be attracted to the site while still keeping existing families in place. Let's look at our site in question, the Lenox Street Housing Development. The site is located in the Lower Roxbury neighborhood of Boston within a zone that the American City Coalition has analyzed as having potential for future development. Lenox Street Housing was built in 1939 and is a family development with 306 units made up of three-story walk-ups. The Boston Housing Authority has recently conducted some energy upgrades to the buildings, such as adding roof insulation and installing more energy-efficient plumbing fixtures, but many component components remain antiquated such as the old inefficient heating system and original masonry walls that lack insulation. Here is an aerial view of the housing development showing the site's continuous superblock and repetitive building configuration. The three buildings to the northeast of the site, the Camden Street Houses, are state funded and also operated by the Boston Housing Authority, but for the purposes of this study, we will focus on the Lenox development. Returning to our thesis question, we will explore both qualitative and quantitative factors that come into play when transforming a public housing project. And we will use these factors to assess four different planning options for the Lenox Street housing site. First, we consider keeping the existing buildings in place and retrofitting them to meet today's energy and comfort standards. We will look at a new construction scenario based on a test fit study performed by the American City Coalition, which provides market rate housing and allotment of low income housing and ground floor retail that, in total, doubles the density of the existing development. We'll call this scheme the mid-rise. Next, we consider a new construction scheme that provides the same number of units as the existing, as well as ground floor retail. We call this low-rise. And finally, we propose a hybrid scheme that combines retrofitting of the existing buildings with new construction in some of the spaces between the buildings, which we will call infill. We then evaluate the four schemes in terms of quantitative metrics. We consider three benchmarks, rentable floor area, the balance of households to remain on the site with the provision of new units, and life cycle energy. Let's take a closer look at this metric. Life cycle energy is energy consumption in terms of both operational and embodied impacts along the lifespan of the building. For the purposes of our study, we will look at the major players of this metric, the energy consumed in the initial manufacturing of its materials, and building operation and periodic maintenance. We are able to simulate and determine the relative performance of a full building retrofit compared to the existing structures. We arrive at these results by setting up an energy simulation model of a representative building in the Lenox Street site. And this model requires a calibration step to get our simulated results as close as possible to the existing. 
To do this, we input all of the known information about the building's conditioning systems and fuel sources, and adjust a few variable parameters within our simulated model, such as infiltration rate and internal loads. As this monthly energy consumption bar graph shows, we arrive at a calibrated simulation for our typical existing building that, re that reasonably matches the simulated energy use with the meter data we received from the Boston Housing Authority. Moving to the retrofitting, we consider a wide range of measures, including upgrading the boiler efficiency, adding additional roof insulation, weather sealing around windows and doors, adding wall insulation, improved glazing, upgraded lighting, and finally adding photovoltaic panels to the roof. For each measure, we plot the overall reduction to the operational energy use intensity, or the total energy use divided by the building's floor area. Because of the state of the existing building components and the nature of the measures, we found certain upgrades to have greater effect than others, and recommend the following. We include lighting and solar panels here because while not providing a large overall improvement in terms of energy use intensity, these measures could represent a significant cost savings. Looking a bit more closely at the wall insulation upgrades, we recommend adding a couple of inches of spray polyurethane foam to the inside face of the existing machinery walls, so as to preserve the character of the exterior brick while still providing added thermal resistance and hair tightness to the envelope. Moisture management and thermal bridging are critical consideration when applying insulation to these old facades, and further investigations should study the effects of ventilation and material permeability to maintain proper indoor air quality. When we plot the energy intensity of the retrofitting scheme against the existing over a 50-year life cycle, we see that the comprehensive retrofit measures reduce its consumption by more than half. Now let's compare the simulated results of the remaining planning schemes. We notice that while among the four schemes there are some minor differences in terms of performance, for example, the mid-rise scheme has the highest initial embodied energy but lowest operational energy. All of the planning options represent a major performance improvement over the existing. Therefore, we shift our attention to the other metrics, having more to do with real estate potential. The infill scheme, while performing relatively the same as the others in terms of energy, is the only one that has the capacity to both preserve the existing community without displacement and also provide new residential and commercial development. So we take a closer look at how to develop this scheme qualitatively to achieve our goals of sustainable public housing transformation. Here's a site plan of the infill scheme. First, we reinforce the street edge between the buildings and activate the sidewalks to create more eyes on the street. In doing so, we permeate the superblock by creating new pedestrian and vehicular thoroughfares and improving existing ones. We create multiple points of entry throughout the development to foster a sense of individual ownership of the streetscape. The plan provides upgraded green spaces that generate a mix of public, semi-public, and private outdoor areas. Lastly, we introduce new retail spaces on the ground floor at the major inter intersections to activate these areas with needed amenities. Zooming into the scale of the housing block module, we organize our infill strategy in three strategic steps. First, we insert a corner annex that enables the existing apartments to expand in size and bring them closer to today's space recommendations. Here is a floor plan of this expansion. Next, we create a well-insulated envelope for both the existing and new areas, utilizing the retrofitting measures discussed earlier. Last, we insert the infill apartments to provide new market rate and workforce housing. This floor plan shows how this infill could fit in relation to the existing buildings. And these close-up plans of the individual infill apartments show how they could be arranged in a variety of ways, such as a four-bedroom triplex walk-up or divided into two individual units. We then address daylight and energy performance as we continue to develop the infill scheme. We look at both the effect of the infill massing on the existing buildings and the internal performance of the new infill. These study maps the direct hours of solar radiation falling on the existing housing in winter and in summer. As we introduce the infill massing, we begin to see its overshadowing effect on adjacent surfaces. We study the effect of a 2, 3, 
and four-story infill volume. We continue with the three-story scheme as it strikes a balance in terms of permitting solar access for adjacent existing apartments and number of units provided. These initial overshadowing studies could be subsequently developed with more varied geometry and time ranges to further inform the infill design. We then look at how changing the window to wall ratio of the infill facades affects the daylight and energy performance of new apartments. Here, we consider the trade-offs between our operational energy use intensity and daylight autonomy, or the percentage of the floor area that exceeds an acceptable natural light level for at least half of the occupied time. We study the effect of changing the windows from 20% of the facade area to 30% to 40% and ultimately choose 30% as the initial digital balance between energy and daylight. We then take these performance guidelines and propose an architectural character for the infill that relates to the surrounding urban fabric. We propose a design that matches the scale and texture of the neighborhood and reinforces the notion of a cohesive community between new and existing. Summing up, we compile our analysis into a series of recommendations that serve as a basis for future designs in the neighborhood. We will now expand the scope of our investigation to walkability within the entire Lower Roxbury revitalization area. We want to make sure that new residents in the Lenox site will have destinations to travel to because people do not just move into buildings, they move into neighborhoods. Here is the entire lower revitalization site, with some geographic landmarks pointed out. To the north is the Symphony neighborhood, to the northeast, Boston South End, and to the west is Roxbury Crossing. The orange line and silver line travel through the neighborhood, providing good public transit access. We will be looking at walkability in specific, and the departure point for our analysis is the 2011 methodology of the walk score metric. This methodology generates simple shortest path trips from homes to plausible commercial destinations. It then scores these trips based on their distance, aggregates multiple trips to common amenity types, and then aggregates all of the trips from a residence to all of the plausible amenities within the area. We will only be looking at the first three factors and analyzing each amenity type, such as grocery stores or restaurants, individually. We will not be aggregating them into a common unified score. To provide a demonstration of our metric, we will look particularly at grocery stores, an important amenity within a neighborhood, and one that provides a good deal of its walkability. This image shows current grocery store access within Lower Roxbury. In the center, you can see the highlighted Lenox site. The only grocery store close to the neighborhood is a Whole Foods Market in Symphony, outside the boundary of the neighborhood. While homes in the north part of the neighborhood have reasonably good access to this site, other homes do not and they are indicated with red as opposed to the green. While homes in the north of the neighborhood have good access indicated with the green color, most of the residents of the neighborhood do not, and their homes are shown with red. Walkability to grocery stores is not very good right now. However, currently under construction is an expanded tropical foods grocery store central to the neighborhood, and its placement greatly enhances the walkability of the area, at least with respect to grocery shopping. Grocery stores provide a simple look at the way our metric scores lower Roxbury, present and future. We will now extend this to look at restaurants, which are more complicated. This image shows current restaurant access within lower Roxbury. There are a few possible destinations centrally located around Dudley Square, but around the perimeter, there is not good access. This image excludes all destinations outside of lower Roxbury, only examining destinations within the neighborhood itself. This image, however, shows what happens if trips are allowed to be generated outside of the boundaries. As you can see, the scores are much, much better. In particular, residences in the north and northeast part of Lower Roxbury have short walking access to Boston's south end, in particular our Lenox site. It is possible that new residents of market rate housing in this site would make trips outside of Lower Roxbury, spending their time and money elsewhere. In order to examine plausible future scenarios for restaurant placement within Lower Roxbury, we place several artificial amenities, evaluate the scores they generate, and then spread those amenities out and see the changes in the scores. The concentration of our hypothetical amenities changes, but the raw number of them does not. Our first hypothetical scenario involves placing restaurants at these current redevelopment sites, which are under construction right now. 
As you can see, the scores central to Lower Roxbury are generally pretty good, because these, because these areas are centrally located. If we take the same number of restaurant constructions and we spread them out along plausible commercial corridors, Tremont Street and Washington Street, the scores do not change very much within Lower Roxbury. We believe that this shows that the particular geometric configuration of restaurant destinations does not matter very much for scores for individual houses within Lower Roxbury. The most important thing is that they're there in the first place. This provides flexibility to planners and commercial developers. We therefore draw four general conclusions about walkability within Lower Roxbury. The first is that new residents of market rate housing, in order to take full advantage of the neighborhood, need new commercial destinations, and existing ones should be strengthened. The second is that one or two commercial cores within Lower Roxbury provide convenient walking trips for most of the neighborhood, but the perimeter will still need additional help. The third is that bunching up commercial development and spreading it out does not make a substantial difference in the walkability of the surrounding houses. And the fourth is that neighborhood walkability is a complex factor requiring complex analysis and engagement with the community to find good solutions. Taken together, the conclusions for both phases of the analysis provide a good set of guidelines for future redevelopment of Lower Roxbury, and we hope that they can be helpful in that regard. Thank you.